Well, what would you think? I mean, I mean, it's kind of a loaded question, isn't it? I mean, if it stinks, it stinks. It smells bad for everybody. Smell bad for you? Yeah. I mean, what do you want me to do, make excuses for him? And, and let me ask the obvious question. Last week you said, obviously, Henry is still the starter. Is he still the starter? Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. <laughs> As I said, we have two really good quarterbacks. We had a chance to win. We didn't get it done. We'll go back to work tomorrow, uh, and we'll go to fixing it, and that's what we're, we're going to do. A um, lot of football season left, whole heck of a lot of football season left. And i tell you what, I saw a bunch of fighters in that locker room, a bunch of friggin' fighters on the sideline, and uh, that's a football team that's going to continue to improve and get better. They're going to fight to improve and get better. I don't know how many games we're going to win, but I know we're going to fight. Quarterbacks are like dogs. I mean, if you throw them a treat, then they respond. You know, they'll – they get smiles on their face, their tails wag, and you know, and then uh, you know, and then pretty soon they'll they'll be a little more affectionate towards you as far as throwing the ball your direction. You see, and we played some pretty good teams and beat some pretty good teams. You know, so we're we're headed that direction. We got a long way to go, but tonight sure was nice. Welcome in the latest episode of that. SEC Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And I'm flying solo for this episode. But don't worry. Got a terrific guest lined up. We got Josh Bertaccini from 92.1 The Ticket in Northwest Arkansas. Going to preview this Texas A&M game. JB, kind enough to join us once again. I think uh, the Razorbacks fans are going to love this episode. So we'll get into that. But before we do, <laughs> bye bye, Dick Saban. Mm. You know, this is becoming a, a weekly tradition here on Thursday. Coach Saban meets with the media, as always, here on Monday and, and then again here on Wednesday. And for whatever reason, maybe it's the uh, 46 point spread against Southern Miss or rat poison. Maybe it's the film review of the Florida game where Dan Mullen and company just tore. His defense, a new one? I don't know what it was, but uh, he was not having it here on Wednesday. And my man was heated. So let's kick it over to Coach Saban. But B-Rob played really well in the game, and Jace really played really well in the game. So, you know, it's not like I sit there and say everybody's going to play this many plays. When it comes to running backs, whoever's playing well and has a hot hand, that's that's who we're going to play. That's how it's always been around here. You know, we've had some really good backs in the past that didn't play in games that were third guys because the other two guys were rolling and playing good. So, you know, plays to the standard that we want guys to play to, and he does it all the time, and he does it on a consistent basis, and he sets a great example for every other player who wants to be successful. Why don't they play like that? Why don't they do that? I mean. Uh, Yeah. What has uh, Jaleel Billingsley proven to you to see his role increased as the season's moved on? Well, he's doing what he's supposed to do. He practices better. Uh, he's more engaged. He's more focused on what he's supposed to do, and, and he's having more positive performance on the field, uh, which is what any player is supposed to do. I, th- I think that did, – did any of you play sports? I mean, the coach is supposed to play the best players, right? And then it's up to the players to do what they're supposed to do so they get to play because they become one of the best players. So that's what he's doing now. Um, but I don't know. Maybe if you didn't play, maybe that's not something that you quite get. Go to Aaron so Sons. to answer your question, he's doing what he's supposed to do. All right, so how about that? Coach Saban, he was not there for any of it. So I don't know what that tells you. Is this team going to come out really fired up on Saturday against the Eagles? Are they not maybe focusing kind of like we saw against the in the Mercer game? You know, they were sluggish. Certainly, had they wanted to, they probably could have beaten Mercer by 200 points. That didn't happen. They came out real sluggish before dominating that matchup. So. We'll have to see, but uh, Dick Saban clearly not happy about something. Like I said, might be the rat poison, might be that old uh, tape he saw from Florida, his defense getting worked by the Gators. So whatever it was, uh, he was let he was taking it out on the, on the media boys, as Spurrier likes to call them. So I just thought that was terrific. Had to start the show with that. And then uh, we're going to jump to our interview here quickly, right off the top of the show. But before we do that, I just want to play uh, these comments from Sam Pittman. He also 
met with the media here on Wednesday. A lot kinder version of an interview here. Looks like the Razorbacks might be at without Dalton Wagner, Ricky Strawberg for this matchup. And uh, some interesting comments here from Sam Pittman. And I thought that would be a great uh, lead up to our interview here with JB. Sam, just kind of what are some of the similarities and contrasts to them trying to establish a, a backup quarterback as a starter and y'all maybe having to reshuffle your offensive line? Well, let's say this. Um, depth is such a key part to any team. You know, you can't be devastated if you lose X, you know, whoever that may be. Um, however, guys are a one for a reason. I mean, there's a depth chart for a reason because supposedly he's supposed to be your best player. Sometimes you find out from a guy that's a, that's been practicing all the time, you find out on game day, he's a lot better than you thought. Sometimes he's not as good as you thought, you know? So I'm so glad last week we had an opportunity uh, to see what we have um, available if Dalton and Ricky can't play. So that helped us. I think the Colorado game for A&M, and when Calzada came in, you know, he ended up winning the game, you know, there at the end on the last drive, you know, driving them, helping them drive down there. And then, of course, the defense stopped him with a couple of minutes left in the game. Now he goes plays New Mexico, whom, by the way, if you haven't seen New Mexico play, man, they swarm. They, they've got a good football team. They run around. And, and um, I thought a and beat a good football team uh, last week. But now the kid, now he's stolen better. He's got better confidence. So uh, I'd say it correlates, you know. Uh, they probably are ahead of us a week uh, because he played a full game and a half and three quarters basically. and our guys in that particular rotation of what we have only played about um, two-thirds of the game. All right, so that was Sam Pittman's final media availability leading up to uh, the Texas A&M game. Now let's kick it over to our interview with Josh Bertaccini of the Red Zone with JB on 92.1 The Ticket. We're joined once again by Josh Bertaccini. You can follow him, of course, at Red Zone 921 He's the host of the Red Zone with JB on 921 The Ticket. Josh, thank you so much for joining me once again. Last time you were on the show, people loved it. Had to get you back on for this big AM game. Well, it's great to be on, Mike. And yeah, as long as Arkansas keeps winning, I'll come on as much as you want. It's great to talk with you, my <laughs> friend. Well, before we get to the game, yeah, that's kind of, you know, I can hear it in your voice. I can hear it during your great show, The Red Zone with JB. You know, these Arkansas fans, they are fired up. And I know you had me on during the offseason. You asked me, you know, what's a realistic outlook for the for them hogs? I said seven, maybe eight wins. And then this week I'm here and you're thinking, man, nine. Nine might even be realistic for Sam Pittman and company. So just how high are, are the hogs right now? I mean, you're absolutely right. You said that before the year. And I remember at the time I was the guy like like preaching a little caution. Let's hold our horses here, but I think this is because we didn't want to get hurt. I mean, it's been so long in Razorback land since Arkansas was worthwhile and, and, and tough and obviously a team that you had to you had to reckon with. So uh, it's just the energy here is tangible right now, Mike. I mean, you go to the store, you go to a restaurant, you just chat and about. People are excited. They're wearing their gear. They're, they're, there's a positivity that's tangible right now. So, I mean, it all leads us to where we are. Arkansas and Texas A&M game week. They're both 3-0, and you know, A&M number 7, Arkansas number 16, a top 20 matchup here in, the, uh, in, in this matchup for the first time in five years, and we're all fired up for it. I wanted to ask you about uh, Sam Pittman. I believe it was right after um, the, the Georgia Southern game. He said, you know, we may not have the best players, but we got the best team, and that's what counts. And as I look across the SEC, you know, he may be right, Alabama – LSU, Texas A&M, a lot of these other teams, they may have better individual players, when you, especially when you're just looking at the recruiting rankings or anything like that. But Sam Pittman seems to have a team that the coaches are bought in. We all know Barry Odom could have left. Uh, he's chock full of seniors, chock full of super seniors, if you will. How well is that playing in that state? And how much is that helping Arkansas this season, do you think? 
Yeah, I think it's a great talking point you bring up, Michael. And and I think when you look at college football these days with the rules the way they are in the extra year of eligibility after the COVID season last year, you want to find guys who are either seniors or super seniors, like you said, guys who have an extra year and are moving to graduate school. Because those are guys usually who are not only veterans and have been around the block in your program, but they're guys who are you know professional caliber players, some of them. You know, maybe didn't like the round they were potentially scoped for. So I'm looking at Arkansas this year, and I'm looking at some defensive transfers, guys like John Ridgeway from Illinois State or Mark Elliott or Trey Williams from Missouri. These are guys who have a chance to get drafted. They, they certainly look the part physically at the at, at the collegiate level. So you know, Arkansas has gotten help on the defensive line from those guys. Blake Kern is a super senior tight end on offense. So is Davion Warren. I'm not saying they're the only program like that, Mike, but absolutely you got to be able to adapt to the new rules and i think that kind of veteran leadership arkansas has you know the exact number it's either 14 or 15 but a lot of guys on this team who are playing extensively who are taking advantage of a chance to have more eligibility and obviously that's given the team poise it's given them leadership on the field and in the locker room and it's given sam Pittman a sense of confidence with this team going into games that they're going to play like they practice, which obviously they need to do this weekend. Now, I was listening to your show this week, so much anticipation with this uh, A&M game, and I heard you say, you're tired of these Aggies waving their butts in your face when you go down there in Arlington. I, f- I feel like there's a backstory there. Can you share that with us? <laughs> <laughs> I remember many moons ago, this is probably, you know, 10 years ago now, being down there and, you know, my wife wanted to go down with a couple of her friends, so they made the trip too. And I'm up in the press box, and Arkansas is playing well. And you know, we go. To, I go down to sit with them in the stands there in the fourth quarter towards the end of the game, and a two touchdown lead goes down to seven. All of a sudden, it's tied, and all of a sudden, A&M pulls it out with a late field goal in overtime. And I just remember all these very pleasant ladies from Texas A&M, some big sorority party, and they were all, you know, super composed and nice during the game. But as soon as things went their way, <laughs> the booty shaking was in full effect. And, and that hasn't stopped, Mike. That was 10 years ago. And Arkansas literally has not won a game down there since. So I think we're tired of it. We're sick of it. I, I think Aggie fans have gotten to gloat for way too long. And I think Arkansas fans would like nothing better and to have a little taste of, uh, of redemption here this weekend. So, uh, you know, has hostilities between these programs, maybe not what they are for Arkansas and Texas, but there is definitely something there to this game. And I think Arkansas feels like this should be their house. I mean, Jerry Jones built it. He was a co-captain on the 64 title team, but mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just treated it a lot more like it's their house in recent years. So, um, yeah, I'm with Paul Five. I'm on this, Mike. A guy you and I respect a lot. He has said for the last, you know, seven, eight years now, if Arkansas wants to get legitimate respect in this league, you don't have to beat Alabama. You don't have to beat LSU. You don't even have to go to an SEC championship game. Just beat Texas A&M once. So they need to do it. They need to do it. Now, where do uh, where would you rate this rivalry? You know, you, you talk with the Arkansas fans every day on your show. I know LSU's a heated one, both the Mississippi schools, obviously Texas. Where would you rank A&M in terms of that rivalry right now for the Razorbacks? Yeah, that's a really good question and and a tough one for me to answer, even though I talk to them every day, because it depends really on what demographic you're talking to. You already nailed it. The only demographic is still Texas. We saw that when they were on the schedule a couple weeks ago. That place was electric, and everybody remembers the Southwest Conference glory days. Now that one gets to come back in the SEC. So I don't think the Texas idea is dead for Arkansas. You already mentioned LSU, Mike, because you know your stuff. You know Hawk fans feel like that game, since they've been in the SEC, has been the one that they get up for the most. Although LSU likes to say, eh, it doesn't work both ways. But that's a big one. And then I'd say here in the modern age, yeah, I mean, look, it should be A&M. But until Arkansas starts getting on more even footing here, it's hard to argue it's an outright rivalry. One other one I, I throw in there, too, is the Missouri game. Another one where Arkansas fans like to point to the history and say, yeah, they got nothing on us, but you look at the last 70 years, they beat you every year. So A&M and Missouri are two of those hex games, kind of residual damage or collateral damage from the Brett Bielema and Chad Morris fiascos. And uh, until you start winning more, it's hard to call anybody an outright rival. But I would say A&M, Texas, 
LSU, you name the right ones. And I'd even say Missouri probably creeping up on the list too. Yeah, I just didn't want to mention Missouri. I've been chastised one too many times from the Razorbacks for, <laughs> even though I think that is that well, is, they like to, they like to pretend that that game doesn't bother them, but of course it bothers them. You got to beat Missouri. Oh yeah, absolutely, Eli. He's one of the most hated men in that state right now. I'd say. Uh, so you kind you kind of <laughs> reference it there. The the game always here in recent in uh, Jerry World in Arlington. You know, it seems like Arkansas fans for the most part are done with this game. Are you done with it being in, in Arlington? And, and how, how badly do you think uh, Sam Pittman and company want this to be home and home for, you know, not only the, the competitive advantage we just saw against Texas, what an advantage those fans are. And that's before you even get to recruiting. Yeah. Well, there's no question, Mike. And I, and I like the talking points here because, you know, absolutely. I think Sam Pittman would agree with us that this game, these we moved back to campuses. I mean, we saw a one-off game last year played at Kyle Field. Right. You know, I know it was a COVID year and it's lucky to draw on whatever, whatever. But that didn't feel right because Arkansas didn't even go to game back in Fable. We haven't seen A&M come to Fable since Johnny Football was there. You know, we're going back eight, nine years ago. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's a competitive disadvantage because Jerry World is two, two and a half hours, depending on how fast you're going from Kyle Field. And it's, you know, six to eight hours, depending on where you're leaving from in the state of Arkansas. And that's just not, that's not equitable. So uh, I just feel like, you know, surely Arkansas can win the game this weekend if they play well. But for to really feel like every year you got a fair shake, I do think it needs to be moved back to campuses. And hopefully now with the realignment of the league, they will do that, Mike. But I'm not saying Ar- – just I want to clarify. I don't think Arkansas should ever stop playing there. Nor do I think Texas A&M at this point should either. either. They obviously have played enough there now. They feel like it's kind of a home away from home for them. And you've been there. I've been there. That's a beautiful stadium. That's a fun place to go to a game. So I feel like non-con games would be a great showcase there, kind of like Arkansas and A&M used to be before they were in the same league. So mm-hmm. hopefully they can figure something out and keep playing there. But I know home fans would love to go to Kyle Field, and I'm pretty sure A&M fans would love to shake their booties here at Razorback Stadium. So Sam Pittman came out today and said, uh, still not sure if uh, Dalton Wagner and Ricky Stromberg, the offensive lineman, will play for the Aggies. I know Arkansas has got a lot better depth. Uh, on the offensive line than they've had in recent years. But how big of an impact do you think it would be if uh, two starters for the Hogs are, are out on that offensive line? Uh, there's no question it's an impact, Mike. And, uh, and I wish that wasn't a talking point. Because it seems like other than that, all signs point to Arkansas is healthy for this mm-hmm. game and ready to go, um, despite some knickknack injuries at the end of camp. But, you know, I mean, Stromberg, he, he's an awesome center. I mean, he's, a, he's on top of every play. He reads – you know, the defense as well. You always see him kind of gesticulating back to K.J. Jefferson. So he's a guy who has a nice rapport with the quarterback. That's going to hurt. That's going to hurt if he's unable to play. And it sure sounds like a lower body, unspecified lower body injury that's going to keep him out. He might actually also have a concussion based on some of the precautions they're taking. But no confirmation on Stromberg. Highly doubtful, I would say, to play. Dalton Wagner now, it sounds like questionable. I had a stiff back, they said, in the second half against Georgia Southern, but you would think a few days later, if it's a stiff back, you're good to go. He hasn't practiced all week. So, you know, it sure sounds like they're going to go into this game now two of the top eight offensive linemen. Now they're confident in depth, and they have a couple of the guys in Ty Clary and Luke Jones who are capable and can step in and have played a lot. But anytime you're going up against an Aggie front, right, with four or five NFL-type players, depending on who you talk to, which they are, um, you want to have all your offensive linemen. So, you know, I like Arkansas in so many matchup areas in this game, Mike, and one of them was I thought Arkansas's offensive line this year was a little bit better than Texas A&M's. If you're down two in your top offensive linemen, I think that advantage gets neutralized a little bit. So, look, Sam Pittman's a good offensive line coach. We all know that. This is going to be a test on him. The line has looked better, but now you're literally sure-handed in the biggest game of the season. Can you plug and play two guys off the pine and make them fit? If anybody can do it, Sam Pittman can. We'll see what happens, Mike. Yeah, and I think one X factor for the other team, the Aggies, I don't know how much you've seen of Anaya Smith this season, but he is incredible. He lines up at running back, receiver. He returned kicks. He he had two returns for touchdowns last week. Both of them called back. But I think limiting him, and you, you got to kick away from him. We You know, the, the special mm-hmm. teams has been a, a house of horrors for Arkansas in this matchup. I think if you limit Anaya Smith – you win the game. Do you, do you think that's fair to say? Well, I love that you pull, you bring up special teams because I still have visions 
of Christian Kirk running kicks back to the house on Arkansas left and right. So, mm-hmm. no, you need to go in the game. You're right. Aware of who the threat is. And don't play to their strengths. It, I mean, you've obviously watched If You know about Smith. This guy is a baller. If you put the ball in his hands with a chance to cut you up in the open field, he will. So I'm with you. Either you're comfortable kicking it through the end zone, and Arkansas has looked comfortable doing that at home the first three games, but who knows how they feel down in Jerry World. If for some reason you're not getting it there, Heck, just kick it out of bounds, but don't give A&M a chance to score on you in special teams. you got to be able to make your kicks. You can't have costly turn. You're right, Mike. In, in, in the last nine years, it seems like every time this game goes down to the wire, there's a snafu somewhere on special teams that blows up in Arkansas's face. And they've been a little bit better the first three games, kind of tidying some things up. But this is going to be a true test of where Scott Fountain's special teams are. I mean, are they ready to go or not? If Arkansas plays well on special teams, I definitely like their chances in this game. If they make mistakes there, Mike, we're going to talk about 10 straight wins for Texas A&M. It's going to be a devastating L for Hog fans. So I just can't wait to see what happens. It's going to be such a telltale game. All right, last thing for you, JB. Do you have the Razorbacks winning and in the streak? Are you ready to make your prediction? I mean, we can do it. And I'm going to say the same thing on the morning show tomorrow here on 92 on the ticket in Fayetteville. And you like Arkansas close. Sam Pittman is 10 and 3 against the spread so far, Mike. 10 and 3 against the spread. He's 6 and 7 overall, which is not bad when you consider the disaster he and he had. 6 and 7 overall, but 10 and 3 against the spread, including 3 and 0 this year. So I'm not saying Vegas got it wrong. They got away at the history, and I get it. But six points? Really? Okay. So. I'm going to take Arkansas plus six. I think it's a close game like usual. I think Arkansas pulls it out kind of low scoring. Both teams will pack the box and dare the young quarterback to win. I like, Kyle, uh, I like KJ Jefferson a little bit better than the young and Zach Calzada in that matchup. So we'll go low scoring, close. Mike, give me Arkansas 20 to 17. I think even if A&M wins close, you still at least are able to put a little bomb on your wounds with a six-point margin in your favor. So Arkansas plus six, but I'm going to take the money line, Mike. Let's go Hogs. This is the year. Hogs outright by three. Man, how much fun are you going to have on your show next week when Arkansas is top ten when they beat Texas A&M? From your lips, Mike. From your lips, my friend. I hope you're right. You've been high on the Hogs all summer. Just keep it going, buddy. Keep those vibes going. All right, he's Josh Bertaccini. Follow him at Red Zone 921. Gotta watch the show, The Red Zone with JB on 921, the ticket. JB, I really appreciate you. Mike, you're my guy. We'll talk to you here real soon. Thanks, buddy. All right, Razorback fans, how about it? I mean, JB's picking them hogs to go 4 0, the streak not getting the double digits, according to JB. And I'm kind of leaning that direction myself. But Texas AM is a hell of an opponent. They're going to have to earn it. It's going to be a lot different than Texas. Texas uh, was not ready in the line of scrimmage. I think the Aggies certainly will be. So cannot wait to preview that game a little bit more in depth with Cousin Shane, who will be back on the next episode. Uh, But beyond that, hey, we've got a couple other items here to update. Let's kick it on down next to Columbia, Missouri. Haven't talked about the Tigers much last week playing CMU, whatever the hell you However you say that, I had 20 people try to (laughs) correct me and tell me how to say it. I do not care about Southeast, Mizzou, State, whatever the hell they're named. But Missouri took care of business. Now they go on the road to face a Boston College team. You know, I don't know what to make of this team. Haven't really watched much of them play. I've watched some of the highlights here before hopping on the line. They're 3-0, which is certainly interesting. Uh, But they've not really played anybody. They beat Colgate 51-0. Beat UMass 45-28 and Temple 28-3 those last two games on the road. Leave it to ACC teams to play at UMass and at Temple uh, before getting to host an SEC team, but it is what it is. The Boston College rushing here. This is kind of interesting for Mizzou fans. They're rushing for 205 yards a game, and clearly that's a weakness of the Missouri Tigers. At least it has been up to this point, but maybe they've played – You know, Kentucky, you certainly respect their ground game. Central Michigan, maybe with Jim McElwain. O.C. Moo didn't give uh, much push against Missouri here, so we'll find out. I mean, this 
is going to be a real test going on the road facing a 3-0 and Boston College team in the part of a country that uh, Missouri hardly ever travels to. Uh, Boston College also averaging 41 points per game, only allowing 10. Again, the competition has been weak, so I don't know how much I read into those stats, but I certainly don't think this is any kind of gimme for the Missouri Tigers. I think they're going to have to earn this one if they're going to get the win on the road. And one of the uh, interesting things here, Eli Drinkowitz was asked about, and I think it's uh, you know it's not something that he'll have the answer for till they meet on Saturday, but it is a great question. Going on the road against a Boston College, they're going to be hyped up to host an SEC team. Missouri's going to have that target on their back. How's that affect the game? And of course, you know, there's lots of issues. Maybe they got them corrected in the the weeks since the Kentucky game, but Boston College certainly going to study that Kentucky tape and try to do the same things to Missouri. So that uh, is certainly on Eli Drinkowitz's mind here. Eli, regardless of the opponent or where it is, when you're the SEC team going into a game like this and you've experienced this on other staffs before, can, can you feel that energy from the other team of we've got the SEC team in, in our building and got a chance to maybe make a name for ourselves? Absolutely. Anytime you're playing against an SEC opponent, you're going to get their best effort and their shot. I mean, it's the best conference in college football for a reason. Um, they all, I mean, you get measured by your performance against SEC teams. They've got a lot of NFL caliber players that, that they know are going to, you know, uh, they're going to watch how they performed against the SEC schools as much as anything. Um, and there's been a lot of trash talk between the leagues. So I'm sure there's going to be a little bit extra motivation um, on both ends and both sides. And so. Yeah, their, their offense has some pro style elements. Can you, can you compare it much to Kentucky just from? Yeah, I would expect it to be very similar. I mean, we 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 struggled with it, so I would I would anticipate that they're going to copy exactly what Kentucky did against us and see if we fixed it. Um, I know that's what I would do. Um, so I expect pin and pulls. I expect outside zone week. I expect duo. Um, I mean, tell you stop it. That's what you're going to get. So. I don't think it's going to be a secret what they're going to try to do. I think it's a matter of whether or not we've learned our lesson, whether or not we we um, have great leverage in the trenches, whether or not we have great hand placement, hands inside, whether or not we fit our gaps, uh, whether or not we can protect our linebackers from allowing the linemen to get to the second level, whether or not we can force edges on the perimeter, um, whether or not we can keep contain. I mean, it's no secret how we got to stop it. It's just are we going to do it? So don't be stunned if this is uh, you know one of the better games here in, in the SEC this weekend. Both the teams, I don't have the analytics in front of me, but they're both they're within five six spots of each other, and I'm talking nationally. So uh, at, at least according to the analytics, this is a very very tight contest, and it being on the road, you certainly understand why I think Boston College opened as a slight favorite against the Missouri Tigers. This should be one hell of a game here, and one Missouri really needs to get to to build that momentum as they still try to climb the SEC East ladder and get into conference play once again after uh, the opener there against Kentucky. All right, next let's kick it on down to Athens, where my goodness, the Bulldogs just continue to roll, and good news here. As uh, we hit on on the last episode, George Pickens back on the practice field. That's terrific to hear. But he's not the only one. Darnell Washington, Tyke Smith, those players are also trending in the right direction, according to Kirby Smart. And that's just going to make who I think is the number one team in the nation that much more potent. Now, it certainly sounds like uh, George Pickens, as you'd expect, a lot further from the field than uh, Darnell Washington and Tyke Smith. But they may not need him this week against Vanderbilt. It's uh, going to be a red and black uh, takeover of Broadway. I'm already starting to see that. I know the uh, the guys from Dogs 247 are going to be down there on Broadway. I think they're going to be at the Valentine. Who knows? I might even have to make an appearance down there. But So let's kick it over to Kirby, who's talked about George Pickens back at practice, Darnell Washington, Tyke Smith, update on their status. Uh, they both uh, were running in uh... – doing uh cardio yesterday did a good job they ran today they did not do their position work meaning they didn't go and take reps 
Um, but I was just walking off the field, and they both ran really good today. They both hit really good speeds. Um, I talked to both of them walking off the field. They felt really good about where they were. They felt really comfortable. They, they're not in cleats yet. You know, cleats aren't the best thing to run in for um, that foot injury, but they, they're in the rubber uh, turf shoes, and they're running really well, and they built up their volume. So we'll increase that tomorrow and see where they are. They're, they're in a much, much better place, and I'm really pleased. I mean, I saw them running with black shirts on today, and I thought, I was like, who is that? That guy looks fast. Um, but it was uh, those guys, Taiki and Darnell. Hey, Kirby. Uh, uh, we were out there yesterday. Got to see George do a little something. First time we've seen him in a long time. And um, noticed he kind of came over and talked to you a little bit through during the uh, middle of that. What has been – what has this whole situation been like for George in your conversations with him? And, um, you know, what, how's his progression going right now? How is he uh, healing up? Yeah, I was excited for George. I guess I can't remember when it was, two weeks ago maybe? Two weeks ago Monday or two weeks ago Tuesday, uh, he had a, a meeting with Dr. Andrews, and uh, he visited with him. And, uh, of course, he's the, the foremost authority, and Ron went and his mother went. They had a sit-down meeting, and he felt like he was in a really good spot and cleared him to do some uh, you know football activity in terms of route running and uh, things on air, you know, not contact. And, and George is uh, running really well. He's 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 a uh, he's a special guy when it comes to coming off of injury. I mean, he's out there running, catching balls. I mean, you you wouldn't think just watching there's anything wrong with him. Uh, but Ron has a protocol, and Ron's following that exactly. George has done a tremendous job of doing what he's supposed to do in rehab, being where he's supposed to be, and uh, he works out. You know, during the practice, he only gets a little bit of time with us. He's prescribed you know, like 15, 20 minutes at the beginning of practice. And then he goes and does his rehab program and his lifting program. And he's done a great job of, uh, of doing that. So what is the prognosis? I don't know. I don't know the timeline on that. I, I do know that he's working really hard. And we've not made it about, you know, George's return. That's not what we talk about. We talk about George getting healthy. And that's what we've consistently sold to him. So this game clearly mismatched. I mean, is it going to be a mismatch Georgia plays anybody outside of Florida and potentially Alabama in the SEC championship game? I mean, anyone else, it is going to be a mismatch. But this is going to be a serious mismatch. mismatch that's tough to say. Serious mismatch with the Commodores here going on the road in Vanderbilt. They're going to have more fans in that Vanderbilt stadium than the Commodores have, I would I have to imagine. And, of course, you know, think back to last season. I had forgotten all about this till it was referenced, but this was the game that uh, Georgia didn't get to play last season. Vanderbilt canceled, and it was at the end, of, tail end of the season, and there was just no way to make anything up. So Georgia didn't have a full slate, thanks to Vanderbilt, unable to participate. And that is something that uh, Kirby Smart, you know, it doesn't sound like uh, – you know, that kind of lingers on his mind too much, but it is uh, something that he weighed in on here. He was asked a couple different ways uh, about uh, not having that game last year. My emotions were just disappointment because the players had prepared, you know, they'd already, I think we'd already prepared once maybe. I can't even remember that, that, that season, but I know that there was an expectation we were going to get to play them, you know, and it was, it was more about, I guess, home game, right? It was about uh, our, our last home game and, and for the seniors, I wanted it because they had meant so much for our program and so many of them had been through, you know, a uh, turnaround. And, and I, I just wanted the game for them. And then when the coach called me, the interim coach called me, I was like, man, golly, it hurt. Um, but I understood it was beyond his control. And uh, it is what it is. I, I really didn't do much to find a game. I mean, I, I text a couple of people just hoping, but it was too short notice. And uh, I know some of the, People upstairs and Josh tried to call and work some things out, but there was not there was no realistic shot. I don't think it was never like it was close to anything. So it could be a bit of a revenge factor for Georgia in this matchup, which I'm just shaking my head thinking about. And I, if nothing else, I mean I think this is a great way for the Georgia Bulldogs to avoid the letdown, knowing that what happened last year and they didn't have that opportunity. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if that really is a factor or not. But I'll tell you what is a factor. Vanderbilt Commodores lost their running back, Ramon Davis, for the season. Really unfortunate. He's a starting running back. He was the transfer from Temple. So he's out of the lineup. And in addition to that, 
I mean, the Commodores have been struggling on the offensive line, shuffling guys in and out at guard and at center, right in the meat of that line. And we all know who the whoever Vanderbilt puts there, who they're going to be lining up against, big old Jordan Davis. So, man, any way you slice this, this is uh, not a great match for Vanderbilt, and it's coming at the worst possible time with injuries and Georgia getting healthy. So, man, prayers up to you, Vanderbilt. You're going to need it this weekend, I'll tell you that. One more item before um, end the show, kind of a quicker one here for you, but highlights from the SEC teleconference. <laughs> Again, this is a two and a half hour call. Not much information gleaned from this, but uh, Dan Mullen did give an update on Anthony Richardson's status. We'll play that. Lane Kiffin pleading with uh, the media to please, please stop downplaying Alabama. We got to play them next. And uh, Mike Leach again, man, this guy is becoming a weekly thing. He's got no interest in doing these t- these conferences, and it's quite clear based on uh, his response here. And all of his responses are basically like this, but this was the best one that I included here. One other, what's your level of encouragement with uh, Anthony Richardson this week during a few practices, through two practices, I guess? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, he's looking good. I mean, we haven't really opened him up a whole lot. So, you know, it, it is uh, a little bit, Similar to last week, you know, that we're not we're going to do an MRI and see where he's at and do a full test on Friday uh, to give him the maximum time to get to 100%. Um, we've done more of practice with him this week than we did last week even, you know, of, uh, of, of opening him up some, but we still haven't gotten him just on, on a full sprint yet. Uh, so, I mean, I feel, I, I, I mean, I, I would think he'll be, he'll be ready to go on Saturday. Hey, Dan, just wanted to know what you've seen from Tennessee on offense. It seems like they, they're really pushing the pace and, and playing with a lot of tempo. And what challenges does that create for your defense? Well, you know, obviously they, that that's their scheme. You know, I mean, it is, uh, you know, spread it out and play and snap the ball as fast as you can uh, to get up there. So, you know, I mean, it's uh, just something different. you got to practice. you got to, you know, it's hard sometimes to uh, to practice the tempo. Uh, at which they're going to. So what we can't do is be shocked by the speed of that once the game starts of how fast they're going to snap the ball, how fast they're going to get up there and, and run plays, and uh, how, how fast we have to get the call, get lined up, and be ready to go execute. And then you, you mentioned the crowd from last week. Um, I don't know if you picked a song yet for the thing for the crowd. <laughs> for, me to go, for me to go perform? I don't know what it is, but the uh, no, I, I, we do need a uh, – we need to have that that atmosphere. I mean, that's what makes the swamp the swamp. That's what gives us a home field advantage. That's what motivates our players. And, you know, so I'm looking forward to it. I think, you know, I mean, you look, we've had two home games so far this year. Obviously, last week's game was, I mean, the crowd was absolutely electric. But I don't want to downplay game one. I thought the crowd was fantastic game one. So, um, you know, Friday night in the swamp, Florida, Tennessee, huge rivalry game. We expect a, a, a great atmosphere and, you know, encourage uh, all the Gator fans to get back out there, continue to support the team, and, and give us that home field advantage. Yeah, and I was wondering uh, if you got a status update on your two linemen. No, I don't. Neither one of them have practiced this week. So I, I, I don't know that it looks good or not that they're going to be able to play. We'll see. Um, Sam, I know you're obviously focused on this this game Saturday, but they released the SEC, the, the 2022 schedule last night. and It looks like the toughest non-conference schedule Arkansas has ever, ever played with BYU and Cincinnati and Petrino and um, Liberty. and, and um, It looks like they're just trying to make it tougher on you every year. I just wondered if you even had a chance to, to, to look at that schedule and kind of think ahead. Well, believe it or not, Bob, I knew the schedule way before it was released <laughs> yesterday. And uh, no, in all honesty, it's a heck of a schedule, and I really haven't thought about it much. You know, I'm pretty sure we've got a tough schedule right now. You know, so I don't have time to think about that. But yeah, I, I've known about it for a while. How would you uh, see? Uh, what, what's the progression you see out of Will so far this year? Have you seen some growth? Yeah. Uh, hey, Lane, I, I know you just said you'd rather, rather the bike come later, but uh, preparing for a team like Alabama, how, how much does an extra week help? Hey, um, as we know, I have you know great team, great players. Um, I wish the media would you know, stop upsetting 
Coach Saban by saying that, <clears throat> you know, this is a weak team, we've got weaknesses. and I mean, let's, they went on the road into a top-10 team into the swamp and won with a freshman quarterback, got an early lead and hung on at the end. And now all of a sudden, you know, it's not a good team and they got weaknesses and can't stop people. So um, that don't really help us a lot, being around there, um, knowing how that place works. So this is a great team and, and you know, like, you know, Coach Beamer said at South Carolina playing Georgia, a lot of five stars, you know, out there, you know, these guys more than anybody are loaded with them. And now you got a second problem. Now they get to go and take the best players from other places, like the receiver from Ohio State, the linebacker from Tennessee. Uh, so now more than ever, you know, you're going to go into a place with, you know, phenomenal players all over the place. <laughs> All right, so don't uh, you, you know it's the reverse rat poison here of Alabama. We'll see how that uh, if Lane Kiffin and company have to pay the price. And uh, certainly seems like Lane Kiffin, who worked for Nick Saban, obviously he knows what goes on behind the scenes down there. He knows what Nick Saban and company will be using uh, <laughs> when they pick it up, any kind of information they can in the media, they run with it. So. I just thought that was hilarious, but hey, that's all I got on this episode. On the next one, of course, we'll have Cousin Shane. We'll be making our predictions. I'm scheduled to have a Texas A&M guest on the line to break down the other side of this Arkansas-Texas A&M matchup, so look forward to that, and uh, I appreciate each and every one of you hanging out. Catch you on the next one.